are a masterpiece. The master of the universe has designed you just the way you are. He made you unique and special. Detail by detail, he carefully imagined every hair on your head. He designed you with a purpose and with a promise. A promise that you may prosper. He gave you talents and interests and the opportunity to be in communion with him. You were created in his image to bring him glory. You are one of a kind. You are breathtaking because you are his masterpiece. Good afternoon, we say Shabbat Shalom to um, those that are joining us today. I wanna to first start by acknowledging our churches here, um, Bethel Temple in Chicago. <coughs> Excuse me, we'll say Shabbat Shalom to you, um, Bethel Temple. Nashville, Tennessee, uh, Dominican Republic, Coral Springs, Florida, East and West Africa. <clears throat> Excuse me, we want to say Shabbat Shalom to you um, as well. I want to say welcome to those that are joining us via our Facebook live stream today. I want to welcome you to our class. I'm a minister Al with Bethel Temple and College. Um, this is a lesson here that I'm extremely excited about. Um, I think it's something that we all get excited about, um, understanding how we can take full and complete control uh, of our destiny. You are in control of your destiny. And what we're gonna talk about today is some of the key elements that we need in order to control our own destiny. Now, when I talk about controlling our own destiny, most people automatically think about finances and wealth and have the finer things in life. But we're gonna see that um, our destiny is not defined by us, that our destiny is defined by the father. You know, the Bible says that he's the author and the finisher uh, of our faith. And so when we talk about destiny, we're gonna look at the broader scope of um, what it is that we want and what is it that the father wants of us? And how do these two things merge together where we can get some of the things that we desire, but that his outcome and his will and the things that he desire is met. And so I'm very excited about this lesson. <clears throat> um, we talk about our destiny and, and, and hope and faith and, and uh, some of the things that we want to accomplish in life. And I want you to know that before we start, our ultimate goal should be to fulfill the wishes of the Father. But we also know that there are some things now we, I mean, we're human, we have human emotions and we have some human desires, but we should not let those desires take over what the father has planned for us. The Bible says to seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and all its righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. And so um, when we put him first, then the desires and the things that we long for, the father says, I'm gonna provide you with those things. And so this is a, a very exciting lesson. We're gonna give you some of those elements that we should be applying. Oh yeah, we do have the control and the power to control our own destiny. And we wanna see what is it that the Bible says and we wanna clear up um, what the Bible says and we wanna take away from what we think, what we believe and how we want to accomplish this goal of um, controlling our own destiny. Um, now I'm going to talk about some of these items here and I, let me just say it now since it's on the forefront of my mind. There are a lot of things that we see the people of the world achieving. And sure, of course, when, when we see doctors and we see famous actors and we see famous athletes and people that are doing great things, a lot of times it discourages the righteous because we start to second guess our purpose. And, and, and now we're trying to make understanding or logic out of why are these people accomplishing great feats and great things and they're not in the truth. There are people who will look at the outset, 
See, looking at people and what's going on in their lives is like looking at someone and trying to determine what's in their heart. Now, sometimes what's in the heart is going to proceed. You're going to see it through actions. But there are things that people are accomplishing. And I wish I had the time to talk about some of the gripes that Job had. Look at the people that are dying in their old age. And they're, they, they've never really had any real problems. And the things that I long for and desire, the unrighteous have those things. They're fulfilling those things in their lives. But I want you to understand that that is their gift. That is their reward. And that's nothing compared to the kingdom of heaven. It's nothing compared to living forever and having eternal life. And so what we want to see today is that our destiny should be in line with the destiny of the Father, the will of the Father. But we can have it both. He'll give us those things that we desire. But we have to put, what is it? Don't put the horse ahead of the cart. And that's what a lot of people want. A lot of people measure their success in life and their destiny being fulfilled by material things. And that should not be our destiny. Our destiny should be to seek the kingdom of the Father and all his righteousness. Our destiny should be to let his will be done in our lives. And in return, he's going to bless us. He promised to bless us. So we're going to see through scripture today that the Father has promised to do some things for us. And we want to just kind of get some understanding um, of what we can do to control this thing. What we can do to walk step in step and hand in hand with the Father and get the things that we desire as well. Okay? So let us go ahead and get started. Minister Nate is not going to be with us today. Um, so you just have myself. And I hopefully, you know, I say this every time I'm by myself. I shouldn't be talking too long. I'm by myself, right? So the class shouldn't go too long today. Um, but we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Uh, with you. I think I'm going to leave it up most of the time today so I don't have to flip back and forth. But uh, get ready for this exciting lesson. You are in control of your destiny. Amen. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and, and move on. Let's set your mind. I'm sorry, this should be, I, I, I don't know how I forgot the you, but set your mind on greatness. And some of the things I'm going to talk about here today is some of the things that the world is accomplishing, is some of the things that the world is doing. Apostle says this all the time. If the sinner is doing big things, if the sinner is billionaire, they're not in the truth, they're not in the faith. I want you to first and foremost understand that there are basic principles that we can apply to achieve the things that we want in life. We set our goals to achieve our dreams. That's what we must do. There is no greater pride than knowing you set your mind on something and accomplished it. Now, again, the first part of this, what I'm going to talk about is going to apply to anybody. If you want to become a doctor, you have to set your mind to it set your mind on the greatness and there's a way of accomplishing it. Those who live with a victim mentality never get to experience the joy of accomplishment because they are always waiting for someone else to come to the rescue. Those who take responsibility get to live the joy of seeing a job well done. Let me ask you a question and I'm going to propose this to those that are listening to me today. Where will you be in five years? You know that you can determine, you can put yourself on a course of action of where you want to be in five years, 10 years, 25 years. Do you know? Do you have an idea? Have you ever dreamed about it or set a goal for it? Are you willing to take responsibility and recognize that it is up to you? You will be wherever you decide to be at that point. You decide. It's up to you. And that's very exciting. 
So a lot of times we kind of throw these dreams out and we say, well, I'm going to be financially stable in five years. But have you set any goals? When I was in business school, we talked about writing our goals down, writing the things that we want to achieve. Put it some place where you can see it every day, where you can focus on it every day. And then when you set those goals, you have these dreams. What is your plan of action? Now, if you want to become a doctor, if you want to become a surgeon, you say, I want to be the best surgeon because I love working with people and I want to uh, be a whatever type of surgeon. Then you set your goals. And we're going to talk about enduring and patience and all these things that we have to put together. But if we do that, we go to the college and they tell us, well, you first have to go to undergraduate school. And then listen, I'm just saying something. So Ms. if, if, if uh, Sister Mary is on, she can probably chime in. But you go to school, you get your undergrad degree. And then I don't know what you do after that. You, you go and, and get your residency. You go to medical school. And then you do your residency. And then it takes, you know, nine years, 12 years, however long. Well, if, if, if you have the plan of action and then you set your goal, I'm going to go to this school first, then I'm going to apply here. And then you put in work. And then there's some things that we're going to talk about later on after that. You're going to achieve the goal. You set the time frame. You're following the steps. You're going to have to endure some heartaches. You're going to have to endure the stumbling blocks, the things that are thrown at you that are stopping you from achieving your goals. Whether it's your health, whether it's finances, whether it's family, whatever it may be, there are some things that are going to come against us. But the first thing that we must do is we have to set our mind on greatness. Now, I know I'm jumping ahead of some of the things that I wrote down here, but there are some fundamental things that we can do first and foremost to control our destiny. If you want to be financially independent and you say, well, I'm in the church, I'm called by his name. I'm in the faith. I keep the commandments. You know, that's not enough. And so across the board, this is why we see people that are in the world as we may think or, or, or say it, quote unquote, controlling their destiny. Now they set some goals and they're achieving their goals. And that may be their, you know, their end result. I want to be financially stable. I want to be able to take care of my kids. I want to be able to go on trips and things like that. But is that really in control of your destiny? Because we're going to see that there are some things in life that people face that you're going to need a higher power than just yourself. And when those things come across, when those things come into your life, how do I deal with those things? People all the time that are rich. We talk about this all the time. People all the time that are wealthy. People all the time that have $100,000 at $500,000 and $2 million homes committing suicide and alcoholics and, and things like that. And then what happens? What happens when the illness comes? What happens when you live to be 80, 90, 100 years old, but you made those material things your idol? You made those things your God. See, what you've, what you've done all those years amount to nothing because that's your life. And we live to live again. Our ultimate goal, we talk about as the saints, and I want to get you straight on this. When we talk about being in control of our destiny, our destiny, the ultimate goal of our destiny is eternal life. We want to focus on how do I get to the kingdom and live forever? Now, I guess I don't want to say the frustrating part, but the crazy part is the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and all his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. So the father said, I was going to give you the good things. The things that you desire, I was going to give to you. 
but you had to do it my way. You had to follow my steps. And people say, well, I don't want the steps. I don't want to do it God's way. Man says, I am in control. I have the power in my own self to control my destiny. And they are fooled. They are tricked. Even up until becoming millionaires and billionaires and leaving inheritance for their kids and their kids' kids. It is a deception that is going to be passed down through gener from generation to generation. And it's a trick of the enemy. And so the center again can set short-term and long-term goals. When you have money, you can be able to finagle and do some things. And man is tricked and believe that they're in control. But we're going to see here today that we have the tools and we have the information and we have the knowledge and the know-how that we are able to control our destiny. Now, a lot of people won't follow it. A lot of people in the faith and the church won't follow these steps. But I'm going to give them to you today. God is leading me to give you the information on how you can control your own destiny. Now, there are so many things, I, and excuse me, you may see me writing some things down because there, there are so many things that I want to say that I don't have here on paper, and I, and I hope I don't forget. Um, and one of the things I just remembered a few minutes ago, I just forgot it. So um, there's so much I want to talk to you about today, but let's go ahead and we're going to move on. And we're going to talk about this control here. We can control our destiny. And I ask the Father to lead me. Most of the time for Minister Nate is here and I stop talking, he talks, it gives me time to collect my thoughts together and, and, and uh, remember some of the things um, that I want to give to you today. But I just pray the Holy Spirit leads me and, and bring those things back to my remembrance um, as we go on. <laughs> so control your destiny as the children of the promise. You have the promises and the ability to control your own destiny. Now you have to believe that. You have to believe that how, I don't care what your financial situation looks like, whatever your living situation looks like, that you are the children of the promise. And you have the promises. Remember we read who are, was it Romans 9 and 4? Who is Yisrael? Right? Who has the adoption and the services of God? and the giving of the law, and the promises. So we have the promises. It all starts with self-identity. Everyone who accomplishes great things has this identity thing where they identify themselves as great. Before you become great, know who you are. Now, people say that they're great, and they're going to be great, and they keep telling themselves that, and they become great along with some other things they have to do. Now, I can say that I'm great because the Bible tells me that his people, the children of Israel, have the promises. The Bible tells me that I'm great, so I'm not being arrogant. I'm just saying what the Bible is telling me. I have identified myself on a much higher level because it is a spiritual level. I almost say this again. If man can tell themselves that they're great from a carnal standpoint, and I can tell myself that I'm great because the Bible and, and the Father, the one who created all things, said it. Man, that's greater than what I can say. Because he has greater control over me than I have of myself. And man believe that they have control and they're their own God. But as the children of the promise, you have the promises and the ability to control your own destiny. Most people believe that it is impossible to have some, I'm sorry, most people believe that it is possible to have some control over your destiny, but not full control. The father said that 
he will establish you as his holy people. So we're talking about the foundation. We're talking about the father now. He's telling us that he will establish us as his holy people as he promised you an oath. If you keep the commandments of the Lord, your God, and walk in obedience to him. He also said that he would make us high above all nations in praise. He will praise you for the accomplishments, for the things that you are able to do. And in name, not only of your personal name, but except people are a part of what? They are part of the family of Israel. And in honor, it is his will to give his people the desires of their heart. We must know how to unlock the mysteries of controlling our own destiny. God knows what's best for you, and he hears the desires of your heart. He will give you the desires of your heart when the time is right. Have patience and trust the Lord. So there's a lot that's being said here. But he knows the desires of your heart. Now, I'm not going to tell you what some of us think. I shouldn't say some of us because I'm, I'm not one of us. But what some people think. People want it in their time. People come into the faith and they're immediately critical of the things that we don't have versus the things that the world has. Hear it all the time. We're supposed to be the people of God. And how come we don't? But he's going to do it in his time. We must be confident. And we must understand that regardless of what happens, regardless of what you see, and here I go jumping ahead of myself again, that you have to have the conviction that you are the true children of the Most High. You have to be fully convicted no matter what happens in your life that the promises are for me. You have to know without a shadow of a doubt that when the time is right, he's going to give me the desires of my heart. And so we have to have patience and we have to trust in the Lord. Now, all these elements have to come into play. It's the perfect mixture. Now, my mama used to make some Kool-Aid when I was little, but she couldn't make Kool-Aid like my sister. My sister put the right amount of sugar away. It was like, woo. The sugar was good and the Kool-Aid was good and put some ice cubes. My mama didn't have the right mixture, but we have to have the right mixture in order to control our destiny. You know, that is power. When you can control your destiny, when you can move obstacles out of your way, when you're going to overcome the challenges that you're faced with. And it takes a spiritual aspect in order to do so. Well, there's so much that we can do in the physical because we see it, right? We see it all over the world. We see what people are accomplishing. So in the physical and the carnal mind, we can accomplish a lot of things. But there are some things that you need the Father to help you with. Man, let's look at some of these scriptures here um, that I have. Let's look in the book of Psalms, the 31st chapter, right? Verse 15. The reasons follow. It says, Lord, I have chosen you alone as my inheritance. See, I'm going to put my trust. I'm going to put all my eggs in this basket. You know, we always say don't put all your eggs in one basket, but here's my inheritance right here. You are my prize, my pleasure, and my portion. I leave my destiny and its timing in your hands. You better leave the timing in his hands. See, we want, want, want. Lord, I want it. Lord, come on, bless me. Bless me. Now, there's two things that has to happen. 
first off, he knows when you're ready for it. He knows when the time is right. I say this all the time and I see it all the time. People get money too quick. They're done for. I've seen people in the faith. I'm talking about this faith. Get a master's degree or a PhD. And they're gone. I've seen people that get the girl, that get the guy. Oh, they were praying and tearing him when they were single. Well, they got the prize. Now they gone. There are things that you don't even have in you that the father's trying to develop you. He's trying to put in you. And we're not ready for everything. So once again, we see in the book of Psalms, the 31st chapter, that our destiny should be in his hands. We should pray. I'm putting it in your hands, y'all. It's almost like a kid. You got a million dollars, right? Kid has a million dollar trust fund. If you guys know anything about trust funds, why do you think that they typically wait until the child is 18 and turn it over to them? Because at 15 years old, you're going to be eating hot flaming, flaming hots with milk in it for breakfast. You're going to go out and buy all type of dumb, silly things. And you give a 15, 14, 13 year old a million dollars. They're going to drop out of school. Might become alcoholics or drug addicts. You know, a lot of things can happen. So just like a child, you can give a person something too much. I mean, too quick. And now what happens is that our destiny is being swayed. Our destiny, we're falling out of line with the will of the Father. I'm going to say this throughout this whole lesson today. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we are saying like, Lord, let your will be done. And then I get mine. What we get and who we become should not supersede the Father's will. And so again, we see here, I leave my destiny and its timing in your hands. I was reading about Stephan. He got stoned. Now, you may say, that's not a destiny, Minister Al, that I want. I don't take no pleasures in getting stoned. People throwing rocks and bricks at me. I don't get no pleasure in that. But that was Stephan's destiny. I'm pretty sure that Moses, all the fighting and wrestling with these hard-headed people, in the abuse and the things that he took. I'm sure Moses wanted to get in the promised land. But that wasn't his destiny. I'm sure John the Baptist wanted to do some things and he had, you know, these ideas of, of, of things he wanted to do at his older age and things like that. But he was killed. That was his destiny. Now, we don't see the, the just in it, but for the gospel's sake. Now, I'm not trying to discourage you and say, hey, have high hopes, but <laughs> you may get stoned. I'm not saying that. But we must leave our destiny and timing in the Father's hands. That's why I get excited about the word. And I'm okay. I don't have to, I don't live to be a millionaire. That's not my focus. Oh, my destiny is to be me. Hey, listen, everybody in the church, everybody in the temple will say, well, I want to be a millionaire. That's my destiny. See, that's not focus on the material things, but let's focus on the Father's will. In the book of Psalms, the 37th chapter, verses 3 through 7. Trust in the Lord. Now, didn't we just talk about trust in the Lord and do good? Oh, he's going to give it to you. He's in control. He's guiding your steps. 
But, you know, sometimes the devil get in our ear and the steps in the way that the father is taking us, we want to take our own steps. We want to go in a different direction. But we must trust in the Lord and do good. Then, then you will live safely in the land and prosper. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desires. Now, people say, well, I delight in the Lord. You know, I use this word all the time called quantify, that we can measure, that we can look in the book and see how do we delight ourselves in the Lord? Delight ourselves in the commandments. You know, the Bible talks about delighting, delight in the Sabbath. What does the Bible say? That if we delight in the Sabbath, I'm paraphrasing that he will cause us to rise up on the highest places of the earth, delight in the Sabbath. So we delight in the Lord by delighting in the things that he has commanded us. Christ says, if you love me, keep my commandments. The Bible talks about the law. Keep my law and my commandments as the apple of thine eye. Well, what happens when people say well, you don't have to keep the law? The people says, well, the commandments, well, you know, it's just two commandments, but it's down. Love the Lord with all your heart and love your neighbor. That's not what the Bible says. On these two hang all the laws and the prophets. So we have to take delight in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desires. You know, delighting in the Lord is a mystery. And we have to show people through the word how we delight ourselves in the Lord. Verse five, commit everything you do to the Lord. Commit everything you do to the Lord, everything you do. Now that takes a, a conscious effort that everything you do, you commit it to the Lord. Now you say, well, Minister Al, I don't know what exercise I got to do with. How do I commit that to the Lord? You know how you commit it to the Lord? When you go get on that treadmill, you say, all right, y'all give me the strength, give me the power. I commit myself to the Lord even in my workout, because I want my heart to be healthy. I want my blood pressure to be normal. I'm doing this, Lord, first and foremost, so I can carry out your will. Now, I ain't saying nobody going to stick the dogs on me or something. I might have to run. So I need to get the legs in shape, get, my, get myself right. But I want to do this first and foremost, so I can carry out your will. See, everything we do, we can commit to the Lord. So we commit everything we do to the Lord. When you go to school, commit to the Lord. I'm going to make more money and I'll be able to contribute to spreading your gospel to the four corners of the earth. You know, you have to put yourself in certain positions in order. I talked about earlier that um, he's going to make us high above all nations in praise and in name and in honor. Now, I don't know how you think you're going to influence the medical community and be honored if you don't go through the, the, the traditional things that we all have to go through called school. Right? We have to put ourselves in a position to be honored. And, and I've talked to people over the years, and we somehow think that being the people of God and being called by the name of Yisrael, that God is just going to flop us in some place and he's going to make us high above all nations and we don't have to put in any work. That we don't have to commit ourselves to doing certain things and put ourselves in a position for him to use us. So we commit everything you do to the Lord and trust him. We are this trust again and he will help you. Now, what is the opposite of that? If you don't commit everything you do to the Lord, and if you don't trust him, well, then he won't help you. Your help is limited. He's telling you the formula that you need in order to control your destiny. He will make your innocence radiant like the dawn, and the justice of your cause will shine like the noonday sun. Be still. Too antsy. Be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. Don't worry about 
evil people who prosper or fret about their wicked scheme. We talk about Joseph. And we talk about Joseph being in prison. And, you know, as many times I've talked about the story, I should remember, but it may have been 14 years, six, 14, 16 years when he was in prison. Joseph had to exercise some things. I'm going to talk about wisdom here in a minute, but he had to have patience. But most importantly, Joseph had to know who he was. And Joseph had to understand the promises that was made to him and his forefathers. And when you understand that, look, it's important that we get the word and that we meditate on his word and that we know it for ourselves, that it is rooted deep within us. Because once we do that, it allows us to be patient. It allows us to be still. It allows us not to lose hope. Now, Minister Al, I don't know. <laughs> Put me in prison about a year, six months. I'm trying to think of a plan to dig myself out. How can I escape? The Lord is showing me when they go to sleep. The Lord not showing you nothing. You telling yourself that I want to get out of this place. And I miss my family. But we have to lean on Yah's wisdom. That's the end, the end part of this lesson. But we got to lean on Yah's wisdom. I'm going to come back to that. And we have to sit patiently and we have to wait for him to speak. And we have to know when we're hearing his voice. Because you know what happened? The Bible tells us that Satan is a familiar spirit, that he has transformed himself into an angel of light. So we have to know if it's the father speaking or if it's Satan speaking. We have to know, is it ourselves speaking? But we show miss that, that food. That pops used to cook. And that stew mom used to make. And Joseph wanted to get out of that place. Don't tell me he took delight in being in prison. And so we have to be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. We can't worry about what we see around us. Look, be confident and know who you are. I don't care who's doing what. And yeah, let people accomplish some good things so it'll light a fire under your butt and maybe you will get up and do what you're supposed to do. But this just shows me that if the sinner is doing it and if it appears that they're controlling their destiny and I've put the word in me and I've meditated and that word is convicted in me, then I know that my desires and the things that I want and the control I want over my life I can have that. Lastly, in the book of Proverbs, the 20th chapter, verse 24, the Bible says, it is the Lord who directs your life. Now, we want to be in the driver's seat, but we have to know how to let the Lord direct our lives. For each step you take is ordained by God to bring you closer to your destiny. Each step you take. That's why you shouldn't marry without getting on your knees and praying and asking y'all and tell them to open up your mind and show you what you need to see. Now, some of you know that he wasn't no good. Some of you know she wasn't no good. But they got money. Ooh, they was fine. Something about them I just like. Unlike it. There are things that we see Come on, now, stop Stop acting holy. Stop acting like you was always holy. You can act holy, but stop acting like you was always holy. You know there were things that you saw, all of us. You got friends, but they were cool and something about them you just want. But there are some things that you saw in them that you knew wasn't right. <laughs> it is the Lord who directs your life for each step you take. So when you select that man or woman, Make sure the Lord is ordaining that step. When you decide to go to a particular job, pray about it. And make sure the Lord is ordaining. 
I, I, you know, I kind of think about when I got into the IT field um, and my first IT job, um, my buddy was telling me about IT. You know, this is when IT was just kind of getting hot. Uh, I don't even think at the time we had AOL. I think that was the first big thing. My friend was telling me about um, IT and he said, just go to the bookstore and get your book and, you know, just kind of read up on some stuff. So I got this book and it's called Visual Something. And it showed you the color pictures and showed you what a router was and what a hub was, what a modem does and all this kind of stuff. And I took a liking to it. And I really memorized the whole book. And I, I applied for a job. I don't know even what or why I even applied for a job in IT because I didn't have no IT experience. And when I got to the interview, well, I was speaking. I was, well, you know, the, the, the modem and the DLL servers and this. Now I'm talking some good stuff, boy. I walked out of there. I was like, hoo, hoo, boy, look at me. You know, you say don't pat yourself on the back. I patted myself on the back because I was saying some stuff. The lady was smiling. She was like, okay, okay. And when she eventually called me back, she said, you know, that kind of stuff was like way over where we're at. But she offered me the job. And when I got the job is when uh, I ran across El Aha. He was always out on the floor. Uh, he was working in another area, and I used to hear him talking to people and things like that. Now, I wasn't in the truth. But that's how the Father orders your step. I think I prayed one time. I was in some horror, you know, you get in a horrible relationship. You know, oh God, please just save me. And I'm going to do it. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. And in ignorance, I just said, I, I'm, I don't want no drunk. I don't want this mess no more. God, I want to change my life. I don't want this mess. And I just want to live. And so we ask God to order our steps in everything that we do. And where we end up, and, I, and let me go back to the story. I'm saying that to say this, that this is where I first heard the truth. This is where I was first introduced to the truth. By going to a place and working at a job where somebody was there who was Israel. And I just, maybe a year before that, you know, I started fooling with the Hebrew Israelites and I thought I was deep. Didn't know nothing, thought I was deep though. And so, we ask the Lord to direct our lives. And the Bible says, for each step you take is ordained by God to bring you closer to your destiny. Being here today, some 20, I don't know, seven years ago, those steps that I took led me to being here today. You that are listening under the sound of my voice today, it was ordained. It was ordained for me to hear this message. You were ordained to be where you're at listening. And in return, you're going to take the messages out and spread it across the entire world. So much of your life then remains a mystery. So your life is a mystery, right? Don't we sit around sometimes and just kind of ponder and wonder like, what's going on? Like, what should I do? And Oh, Lord, I don't know what to do next. Doesn't that happen to us? I don't know if I should take this job. I don't know if I should talk to this person. I don't know. You know, we run across that maybe every year, every other year, where we just don't know what to do. Should I move out of state? Should I move here? Should I do that? Where's God trying? And we don't really look at it as God is leading us. But now that we're conscious of it, we should pray and ask God. Ask him to order your steps, to lead you into your destiny. Whew. Look at Minister Al. I've been talking. I haven't got halfway through yet. And so we're going to continue on if I don't finish. But uh, let us move on looking at unlocking the mystery. Let me go ahead and share this again. Unlocking the mystery. Let's talk about that. Unlocking the mystery of how to control your destiny starts with living according to his will. We talked last week about the gospel, right? 
how do we identify the gospel? Uh, let me write this down here. Uh, because do you know that in the Bible, and I don't I can't look at I can't look it up right now, but we talk about the kingdom of God. We're talking about eternal life. There's something that's said in the Bible that's always associated with eternal life. It says preach the kingdom. So when you are preaching the gospel, that is what we need. The gospel is an extension or the kingdom of God, if you will. It's the same thing. You're getting it verbally. So you have to accept the kingdom and the kingdom is the gospel. Once you come into acceptance of what that one gospel is, it's preparing you for eternal life. And so they were preaching the kingdom of God. And I think it says it that way. But we have to live according to his will. So it's very important for us to control our destiny and for others to control our destiny that we first sit and learn, that we understand what we must do to please him. So we talk about this unlocking the mystery. It starts there. It starts with the gospel. Living according to his will allows you to control the two most important elements needed. Now watch this. Those two elements is to have favor or power with God as well as favor or power with man. Oh, I see. Doesn't it make sense? Doesn't it make sense that um, if you are controlling your destiny, that you're going to need some spiritual help? You're going to need some spiritual power because your natural power is not enough. So doesn't it make sense that if I'm going to be in control of my destiny, that I must have power, I must have favor with God, and then I must have favor with man? Now, God is going to give you the power. See, there are things that you're not in position. You're not in position to negotiate. You're not in position to negotiate with the CEO. You don't even know the CEO. So how does God give you power with man? Now I'm jumping to the end again. We talk about this wisdom. We talk about being quiet. Don't go curse the man out because he's talking sideways to you or you didn't get certain benefits or you didn't get that position because sometimes God is preparing you to move you somewhere else. Sometimes he's putting you in that position with that conflict so that you can overcome as a testimony. But he has to order your steps. He has to tell you what to say to that man or that woman. He has to show you, how do I find that extra money so that I can get back in school? Who do I talk to? Y'all direct me. There are some things, when, some years ago, <clears throat> I told you the story before when um, I had, think I had four classes, I think, something like that, four classes to get my undergraduate degree. And it took me five years. Five years. And do you believe that it was something so simple that I didn't think about. I don't remember what it was right now, but whatever it was, I said, oh, I could have did this five years ago, been to school and been five years ahead, you know, got my master's degree and things like that. But emotionally, I kept saying, well, I don't have the money, man. Shoot, I'm trying to get back to school and I got to figure out how to get back to school. Emotionally, I was all over the place. But I didn't take a deep breath and I didn't meditate and just sit down and just stay. Okay. I'll just, we're going to sit here and we're going to think about it. And whatever it was, I'm going to come back to you. I'm going to tell you what it was, but whatever it was, it was so simple that I think that there was some company. I think I was able to consolidate my loans and bring them out of default. I think I had to pay six months or something, a small amount. And then they took them out of default and I was able to go back to school and uh, finish those classes. Like it was something so simple. 
But God has to show you those things. Now, I got it on my own, right? And I'm not saying I got it on my own. Maybe the Father showed it to me. But if I was in the Word like that, if I was really focusing, He could have showed it to me five years earlier. But we must have power with the Father. And we must have power with men. Does that make, does that make sense to you? That all the roadblocks and all the things that happen, that we're going to have to have power, we're going to have to have favor with both? Now, I don't think I got the Father. No, you're not going to usurp this natural thing that exists and just say, I'm Yisrael, man, give me the job. <laughs> That's not happening. Get out my way, devils. Move to the side. I'm called by his name. That's not. So you're going to have to have the Father to intervene. And you're going to have to have him help you to deal with man. Amen. Let's go back. It should be clear, therefore, that the foundation of the Father's will is to become his people, Israel. Because the Bible says, and I'm going to give you this Bible verse. Understand this. The Father in all that he represents gets his glory through you, his chosen vessel. Right? Isaiah 43rd chapter, verse 7. Says he gets his glory through you. Now, that may be hard for some people to believe. Now, yeah, I mean, come on. Would the Father get glory in burning half the earth up? No. Because you're going to say something crazy from space happening. We don't even look and give God the glory when we see the water. Like sometimes I drive... Downtown Chicago by Lake Michigan, man, I look at that, I said, boy, look at y'all. Like for you to see something on TV or a picture and to see it like up close. So we don't get the glory to y'all. He's going to get the glory through you. When you are on top as a nation, when we're accomplishing things as a nation, yeah, you're going to get the glory because they see you. They see Dr. Tate doing some amazing things. Right. They see some of the other people doing amazing things in their field, in their areas. They see the anointing on people and and his people laying hands on the sick and they shall recover. Now, that's within his will. See, he's going to allow those things so that he can get the glory. See, people have to see you in order to see him. The Bible talks about us being the light into the world. I'm going to talk about that here. So our destiny is aligned with his thing. All right? It is you, the people of the Most High, who will be a light unto the world. So we must align our will with his will. But at the same time, we must understand that his perfect will always supersedes our will. Now, there are some people who, in the faith, who pass on. He said, well, they were Yisrael. Why did they pass? Because it was according to his will. And there are some things that we don't understand. But that's why I say you have the conviction. There are people who left the faith. They said, well, the Bible promised us that we can live at least 120 years. And some people are passing early. Now they start to question the gospel. They start to question Yisrael. They start questioning the things that they've learned that they've been proven because they don't understand the will of the father. But his will is going to supersede ours. The Bible tells us that if we seek the kingdom of God first, he will reciprocate his love by giving us our desires, right? Because you're not doing anything to take away from his will. Was it Solomon who asked? He said, I want wisdom. I want wisdom. Now, wisdom is the highest level of knowledge and learning. And I mean, it's, it's knowledge and how to apply the knowledge and when to apply the knowledge. See, the world has knowledge, but the wisdom comes from the Father. They got this Corona, Delta virus, whatever, they got Corona. Well, if you had the wisdom, then you would have killed the first virus. If you created a, a vaccination, and I'm not against the vaccination, you know, to each his own. But that vaccination would work. So we're talking about knowledge versus 
wisdom. I'm not going to get into that, you know. But let's go ahead and look at these Bible verses. Um, in the book of Matthew, the sixth chapter, verse 10, we pray that your kingdom will come, that what you want will be done here on earth, the same as in heaven. So I talked about that. This is just a different version. Let his will be done on earth. Say, yeah, I yield. I yield my will to your will. Because my will and my destiny is to fulfill your will. And that's how I look at it. That's my destiny. Do I know what my destiny is? Absolutely not. Do I have desires? Yeah. Do I want money? Sure. Do I want some other things? Sure. But Yah, let my destiny be your will. And then he'll give you those things. Then he'll bless you like he did Solomon. Because I don't desire to have, you know, listen, I'm a frugal guy. I go get my hair cut every two weeks. It's getting a little wild. You know, when it get white, I need to get it cut every three, four days. I don't need all that. I tell you, I'm still driving my car. I looked at it today, 370,000 miles. I don't need all that. I was talking to somebody today earlier. I'm not paying $800 a month for a car, though. No. Need all that. If I was making half a million dollars a year, I still can't justify. You say, well, Minister, oh, yes, you will. Well, I don't know. Maybe I will, but I can't justify paying $800, $900 a month for a car. For what? To go to Moon Oink Piggly Wiggly? To go see my mama? May drive somewhere, you know, see some friends. Drive to the office. What do I need to pay that much money for? For a car. So I'm okay. Yeah. I'm all right. Now, I'm not saying I won't say totally, yeah, but I'm all right. The finance is not my destiny. That's not, that's not it. So we have to think about destiny different and our destiny different and stop separating the will of God from our destiny because it shouldn't be separated. I quoted earlier. Genesis 32nd chapter verse 28. I'm going to read that. I know we read it. I know you guys know it, but I want to read it just in case there are people who are here that may not understand what I said, that it, we need two very important elements, and that's to have power or favor and power with God and favor power with man. So he's calling the entire world. I promise you. I promise you. Old Testament and New Testament. Kingdom of heaven. I promise you that when you are grafted in, people talk about grafting in. And they see it in the book of Romans. And they see it in the book of uh, Ephesians. But when the Bible talks about grafting in the olive tree and grafting the world in and the Gentiles in, he was talking about grafting them in with the people of God. And when they were grafted in, they took on the name of Israel. He says, uh, Jacob was wrestling with the angel. He asked for a blessing. He asked for a blessing. He asked for a blessing. I'm going to say it one more time. He asked for a blessing. Says, I won't let you go until you bless me. And Lucky Charm didn't show up. The pot of gold didn't come. But the angel of God said, What is thy name? Jacob said, My name is Yaakov or Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Yisrael. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men and hast prevailed. Now, you tell me that's not controlling your destiny. You need to contact me, find out how do I take on the name? What does this Yisrael stuff mean? How do I have power with God and man and prevail? And let me say this. In your quest to control your destiny, it says has prevailed. That means that you're going to go through some, some trials that you have to prevail over. That means that you're going to have some roadblocks that you're going to have to prevail over. That means that there are some negative situations that are going to come your way that you have to prevail over. And Joseph prevailed. 14 years in prison. He prevailed. Don't tell God what the timeline is. All right, Lord, I've suffered enough. I get it. You're trying to show me something. Release this thing from me. <laughs> Don't work that way. Remember we talked about it in his time? So these are what we, some of the things that we must do to unlock 
um, the mystery. Your destiny, and I, this is one of the things I, I've been kind of talking about today. Your destiny is not just about earthly and material possessions. See, people get excited, whether it's in the Christian world, whether it's in the house of God. People get excited about controlling your destiny because we first and foremost, we think about being wealthy and we think about, you know, the good life, which we call the good life. So your destiny is not just about earthly material possessions, um, financial or monetary gain is not a measurement of God's love for us. Remember, we are asking the Father to order our steps and that we fulfill our destiny so that his will can be carried out. The book of Mark, the eighth chapter, verse 35 through 37 said, any of you who try to save your life, you have will lose it. But you who give up your life for me and for the good news will save it. It is worth nothing for you to have the whole world if you yourself are lost. You can never pay enough to buy back your life. Now, this is the Bible verse, what profit of man to gain the whole world yet lose his soul. There are many times throughout our lives where all that we may have is our conviction knowing that we possess complete truth and that eternal life is a promise to us. We must hold on to that promise no matter what our end becomes. Stephen was stoned. You think he cursed God? Paul was left for dead several times. You think he cursed God? But what we can see from the stories we read from the Bible in particular, I talked about Solomon, and I want to warn you about something, because we seem to have this sort of attitude, and we, we incorporate this into our prayer, and we're going about this thing all wrong. Father, bless me, and I'll bless you. Give me the finances, and I'll fund your ministry. I'll preach the gospel all throughout the world. Give me, give me, give me. Wrong attitude. Wrong way to pray. The Father wants you to do what, what you have first. Now I coach football, and, you know, I hear whether it's in football or whether it's at work. I want to be this. I want to do that. What are you showing me? When I was a manager at the university of our, our corporate help desk, there are people who were taking, uh, they took calls, they were help desk analysts, they took calls, and some of them had degrees. And they wanted to get out of that position of taking calls and um, I want to be a supervisor, I want to move in other areas and things like that, take me off these phones, whatever. And do you know, I look at the people who had something in them, who did the little things, who say, oh, you want me to do such and such? Or, um, hey, can I help you train, you know, the next group that's coming in? Wasn't about the people who had the degrees. But it was about what you did without the position. Are you displaying supervisory type skills and you're not a supervisor? You know, those are the people that I trained. Those are the people I brought along. Those are the people that I mentored. So you walk in this thing before you even have it. Don't tell me nothing about I want to be an elder. I want to be a mother. I want to be an apostle. I don't care what you say. And you can talk, talk, talk. But are you operating in that position? Are you operating in that role? So when you come to the Father, don't make no backdoor deals like this some mafia stuff. 
give me y'all and I give you. No, I gave you enough to work with. What are you doing with what you have? Now I'll tell you, and I'm saying this, I'm not telling you this. I don't I, I don't make this statement. Look, I have degrees. I got two master degrees. Guess what minister I'll do to help fund the ministry and go on trips and stuff like that? Get right on in that Uber. You can laugh at me all you want. Uber Reeks, here you go. <laughs> Thank you for your order. <laughs> what are you doing? And I'm telling you this as a testimony. I'm not telling you this is no, you know, because ain't no glory, no Uber stuff. But being a director at a university, and I still do certain things because we need certain things. We're trying to accomplish certain things. And I'm telling you this to motivate your own selves. What are you doing with what you have? And this is the heart that the father looks for. This is how you open up doors. And he looks upon you favorably like he did Solomon. What are you doing with what you have? Now, I, I listen, Mr. Al is guilty. Well, I can't pay my tithes because I don't have, uh, what is that $60 going to do? Oh, that $90. Well, I, we got to pay such and such. Mr. Al has been guilty. Well, the man robbed from God. So we won't plant a seed consistently being obedient to his commandments, but yet, look, that's between you and the Father. I don't get into your life. I don't know what you're doing. But you know what you're doing. You know what you're not doing. And so we have to do first. There are ways, like, this thing is deeper than just keeping the commandments and being called by the name of Israel. Like, you got to really understand what the commandments are. You have to understand what opens up doors and what gives you favor with the Father. So I want to get that straight of us sitting and waiting for y'all to do something. You know what y'all doing? He's sitting waiting for you to do something. He waiting for you to do what's right. So we have to have this conviction. We have to hold on to his word. And I keep going back to Joseph, whether it take 14 years. I've been baking, frying this chicken for Nine years, this recipe my grandmama and everybody tell me is good. And I can't open up no restaurant. Keep frying some chicken for five more years. And we're going to add something along with your works and your faith. Because you got faith, that's why you keep doing the works. But something has to be added on to that. Man, let's go to First Peter. First Peter, the first chapter, verse 2. But whether I live or die is not important. For I don't esteem my life as indispensable. It's more important for me to fulfill my destiny and to finish the ministry my Lord Yasha has assigned to me, which is to faithfully preach the wonderful news of God's grace. Listen, I've convinced myself, I've told myself, I've accepted the responsibility that my destiny is to finish the ministry that the Lord has assigned to me. A car can come. If I don't put him first, why are he going to protect me? A car can come and mow me down. Things can happen in my life. Why do he have to protect me? I didn't put him first. See, the highest goal that you can obtain is to do his will is to commit yourself to him, to fulfill your destiny by finishing the ministry that he put you here for. Oh yeah, you may make great contributions in the IT field. Oh, you may make the meanest spinach dip and sell more spinach dip throughout this world than anybody's ever done. Great for you. But your ultimate goal, your ultimate goal is to create this environment where the world can hear God's word and that we preach everlasting life through the faith by way of the true gospel. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange 
for his soul. I'm not giving nothing. But I'm going to continue to walk in the faith so that I may control my own destiny. A couple of more things here. We're going to get out of here and give you your the rest of your Saturday Sabbath back. How great are your works? Boy, I'm, I'm, ooh, I couldn't wait to get to this here now. Father wants to use you for greater works. But how great are your works? We talk about our destiny and control of our destiny. I'm going to tell you something. This hurts. This portion hurts. The faith part is easy. The keeping the commandments for most is easy. But this is the part that hurts. I don't know if you've ever obtained anything. And I keep talking about um, uh, Sister Tate, Dr. Tate. But I don't know if you've ever obtained anything of great value. Whether you had children and you finished the degree, whether you had back fat or side fat or whatever it was, and you got a six pack, let me tell you something. I was laughing with Minister Rachel. I said, boy, listen, boy, that belly fat is stubborn. As much as I work out, you have to do intense. You hear me? I'm talking about intense until your heart stopped for about two seconds aerobic exercise consistently along with the diet in order to, to lose that stubborn fat, <laughs> that fat, belly fat, back fat, side fat, whatever fat is stubborn. And when you see somebody with a six pack, I'm going to tell you something. Whew, they put it in because it's the hardest thing. You can be ripped up. I've seen guys, big old muscles, but they, Got a little pudge there. So it's difficult. So when we talk about controlling your destiny, accomplishing the things that you want in life, the greater things, it hurts. It hurts. And you go through. And when you come out on the other side, you don't even understand and see how you did it. So I don't want you to think that this thing is easy. We're naive. We think that faith and being, I'm Yisrael, so that's a great start. But what are you, D-O-I-N-G, what are you doing? Whether you want to have your own business, listen, a lot of folks got their own business. So oh, I got my, my EIN number and I incorporated myself. Now, how do you merge and how do you go into a market where a million people are and you come out on top? How do you do anything that many people are doing and you're going to be high in honor and in name and in praise? It takes a whole heck of a lot of work and it's going to hurt. And so we don't value this much, but I want to talk about this. Having the power to fulfill our destiny takes great faith and as equally important, great works, greater works. Works is probably one of the most underrated element, elements in, con, in controlling your destiny. Many within the faith believe that mere faith and doing the Father's will is enough. We should work as if yoked to Yasha Mashika. Like we're walking hand in hand. And you look at what he had to do. Do you think that it was easy? Now I know this was God in the face. You think it was easy to get beat? What is that movie with Mel Gibson? Um, it was sickening. Uh, Passion of the Christ. Like, I don't know if they overdid it or underdid it. I don't know, but just the beatings and the stripes and being pierced. And all that he had to suffer for our sins. Look, I didn't experience it. Don't tell me nothing. That was some, that was something that he had to endure. That was a great work. So many within the faith believe that mere faith in doing the Father's will is enough. We should work again as if yoked 
to Yasha Mashikot. Our work and the decisions we make should be based on these principles aligned with God's moral standards. So everything we do should be aligned. Sure, Noah believed that he had the ability to build the ark. However, it took great works to complete the task. Now don't tell me about your faith. Don't tell me about I'm Israel. Don't tell me about what Yah told you. For 120 years prior to the flood, Noah and his sons constructed a massive ark. 120 years? We complain about going to the social degree for two years. <laughs> but for 120 years prior to the flood, we see Noah and his sons constructed a massive ark. The ark was a quarter of the height and half of the length of the Titanic. He had a, a hammer, some wood, and a nail. Some nails. And they have all this fancy stuff, prefabricated wood and things like that. No wonder it took so long to build. Even more remarkable, Noah built it by faith. In L. See, we have to have the faith first. We have to have the faith and the belief that L is with us, that he's directing us. We have to have faith that he's going to give us the strength and the energy. We have to believe and trust that he's ordering our steps. And then in due time, he's going to release the blessings little by little. Up until then, mankind, now watch this. Up until then, mankind had no experience with great floods. So there never was a great flood like that, let alone with massive shipbuilding. In other words, Noah had never seen what God told him. Never seen a ship. At least you saw the Titanic. At least you've been on a cruise before. You've seen a great ship. Like, imagine your eyes have never witnessed, have never, you saw a rowboat. But you've never seen nothing as massive as this. So imagine the faith that he had to have. By, um, by faith in Elohim, however, Noah obeyed and still is one of the most famous men ever. So you walk into your destiny by faith, not asking you to build no boat like Noah built. Not asking you to build a skyscraper shaped like the letter Z. But ask the father, what is it that you will have me to do? What is it, Father, that's my destiny? We said it's, going, it's, it's a mystery. Nobody knows what the end. Nobody knows where you're supposed to be in 10, 20 years. But you can talk to Yah. And he's going to help you along the way. Now, this is always funny and amazing to me that he's God. Put Noah and his sons in a deep sleep. When they wake up, let the ark be built. Come on, God, you can just, you know, would have thought the ark would have been there. No. Although he's God, he created all things. Noah, you're going to create that ark. <laughs> I'm not creating it. You're going to create it. And you got 120 years to do it. Now, some of you would have been smart. Come on now, God. Now, you, you did all this, man. Can't you help me? Can't you? Yeah, I can help you. I can encourage your mind. I can give you some strength, but you're going to do it. And we have to do the same thing. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Now, you know what? I'm not going and giving a lesson today in faith and all that kind of stuff, but it's impossible. It's impossible to control your destiny without faith because you're not pleasing God. But we can say the same about works since faith without works is dead. So we have to come up with a plan. Even Minister Al, you know, yeah, I'm online, I'm on Facebook Live, hello world, I'm online. But you think that's enough? I got to do better. I got to get better. I have to work on my plan on, just because you're online don't mean that people know you online. How do they see you? Y'all, help me with my words. Help me to say the right things that will penetrate the very soul 
of man, that when they hear it, they'll accept. So I got to work on myself. I'm riding in the car and I'm talking to myself. I'm my little speeches and my little stuff. No, I don't say it. Before. And I'm just, you know, maybe it's me and y'all. Maybe it's me. But there's a way that you have to present. There's a, a comfort that you have to bring people into. You ever hear somebody talk and they just, man, Prophet Hebrew does it. He talks and he just draws me in. Great orator. And it's just something about his essence and his aura that, so you have to present that through whether it's audio, whether it's video. So we have to continue to want to get better. Now, the best person, the best actor, the best singer, guess what the best singer got? They still got a singing coach. It's like, man, they don't want all these Grammys or all this stuff. Still got a singing coach. The greatest athlete, he's still going to work six, seven hours a day in the gym. So our works is extremely important. Faith without works is dead. Now I'm going to finally get to my last bit of something here that I keep jumping. And I, I talked about this. And I'm going to end this lesson here with this. Top it off with divine wisdom. We got the plan. We know that we must live within his will. We know that we must be called by his name. We must exercise faith. Now, that's a disciplinary. I mean, I'm sorry. That's a discipline all by itself. We can have four or five lessons on how to exercise faith. We can have four or five lessons on works. But it's all for not without the divine wisdom of the Father. All that God deemed essential knowledge for his children is found in his word. Now, here's the amazing part. The Bible. The Bible's all over the world. And it's just a book with words to a lot of people. Because it has to be interpreted. You have to meditate on it. You have to pray for wisdom. Now, you're not going to get wisdom without being in the word. You have to have the words in you. You have to know what the words say. And then you have to know how to apply those words in this book to your life so that you may control your own destiny. Beyond that, all truth is God's. There is a difference between earthly wisdom and the wisdom that comes from above. To tap into God's wisdom, we must first of all desire it and ask God for it. The Bible says if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. The next verse specifies that we must ask in faith, not wavering. Don't waver in your faith. Now, when the Bible is talking about ask for wisdom, it says you should ask God who gives generally to all without finding fault. Now, he's not giving, this all is not talking about the sinner. It's not talking about the Gentiles. It is talking about his chosen people. So this is what makes us the head and not the tail. This is what allows him to make us great in name and praise and in honor. Because we're going to him with our works and with our faith. And we're going to him and saying, give me the wisdom now. I got the knowledge. How do I apply it? Where do I apply it? When do I apply it? Keep the faith and don't waver in your faith. We acknowledge that true wisdom comes from God and that Christ is the embodiment, I'm sorry, an, an embodiment of that wisdom. To trust in Christ and yield to his Holy Spirit is to walk in wisdom. To have knowledge is to have understanding or information about something. That's what knowledge is. But to have wisdom is to have the ability to apply knowledge to everyday life. Only the true children of Israel can do that. 
It is in the reading and understanding of God's word that we obtain knowledge and meditating upon that knowledge brings wisdom. Why do you think the Bible tells you to meditate on his word day and night? Go back and read why I said that. We have, we have it. We have the power today. If you never understood before today, you know today that you have the power to control your own destiny. Listen, God desires for you to do it. And it's right here in his words. And his words have to be taught to you so that you may have understanding on how to apply it. Now, there are, there, are, there are levels of faith. There are levels of work. Um, there are some things about his will that we must understand, but we have to keep seeking out the righteousness. And we can break through. Now, I don't know about you, but what a wonderful thing to know that your destiny is in the palm of your hands. That you can control where are you going to be in five years and 10 years and 15 years? And when you put the father first, when you acknowledge him in all things, when you continue to work in the faith, like our pastor Andre, like our evangelist in the Dominican, elder, and all the other people, when you are continuing to put forth work with the little bit that you have, you're obtaining power with the Father. Oh, he hears you. He sees you. And that's why I can take comfort. I'm not so anxious. Because I take comfort in where I'm at and what I'm doing. Now, I never get satisfied in that area because then you stop pushing to do better. But I know I'm walking in the truth. Now, a lot of people may say that. You know, to each his own. But I know that what we have is the true gospel. We can control it. Exercise the faith today. Exercise the works today. In your prayer, tell the Father to send you wisdom. Send you wisdom in all aspects of your life. In your marriage. In your finances. In your career in your health so that you can have complete control of your destiny. I want to thank you all for joining me today on this exciting lesson on this beautiful Sabbath day. The Bible says to delight in this day. Man, he will cause us to ride on the higher places of the earth. I thank you again. I thank all of our visitors for joining us. If you have any questions about the message that was presented today, you can inbox me um, on our Facebook page, hashtag um, uh, Restoration Gospel, and I'll make sure I get back to you. Listen, we would love for you to be a part of this great ministry, whether you're in Florida, um, whether you're in, in the Tennessee area, Chicago area, or whether you're anywhere within my hearing or, or what you're hearing today in the country and the world. If you would like to be a part of this ministry, if you would like information on um, the children of Israel and the nation of Israel and the true gospel and what you need to be completely saved. Then we ask that you go to our website, www.tvfaithl.net. That's TV. I'm going to put it here in the chat room uh, right now. I just want to put it in the chat room. That's tvfaithl.net. And then we have a lot of different information uh, there, frequently asked questions. We have our short videos, Sabbath summaries there that you can go through. But we ask that you scroll down to the middle of the page, click on become a member. And we can talk to you personally uh, about baptism and, and, and what you need to be saved. Uh, talk about the, the Hebrew salvation name and the feast days and, and all of what embodies the true gospel. Listen, we can't get this wrong. We got one, one shot at it. One shot to get this right. The Bible says the day you hear my voice, heart, not your heart. So I hope that the Father has spoken to you today through my voice 
through the message that you heard today. And we look forward to seeing you. We look forward to talking to you. We look forward to fellowshipping with you. On behalf of Bethel Temple and College and Minister Nate in his absence, I'm Minister Al. I want to depart you today by saying Shabbat Shalom.